All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is our second annual pre-COP webinar leading up to the conference taking place in just 11 days from now at uh, Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt. Uh, we at the coalition feel it is really important to provide a general overview, not only to our governmental technical teams and the countries we work with, who already understand the importance and goal of these conferences, but to everyone else who is interested and genuinely concerned about how the United Nations addresses the climate crisis, and more specifically, because we are the Coalition for Rainforest Countries, the role forests play in keeping us on track to meet the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. <clears throat> I have with me today Leonardo Masai, our Senior Policy Expert and Associate Professor of International Environmental Law, and Thelma Krug, our senior technical expert and vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, both who also helped me understand the important details that I need to know about the policy and science involved in these discussions. As always, you're free to ask questions in the chat during the session, because again, our main purpose here with these webinars is to help you understand these issues. Uh, we'll address those questions at the appropriate times. And also please know this session will be recorded to be released to you all afterwards and use for future training purposes. So without further delay, let's turn it over to Leo to start and give a quick recap of COP26 that took place last year in uh, Glasgow, Scotland. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for your introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, again at this uh, time of the year, as usual. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure also to have Thelma with us. So uh, welcome everyone, and this is uh, just going to be a very quick meeting just to give you an idea on what is going to happen at the COP27 and what will be the role of forests. Because before getting into that, let's uh, briefly recap uh, what and where we left, mainly COP26 uh, that happened last year in Glasgow. Uh, COP26 uh, is uh, uh, happened last year in Glasgow, November, and a lot of expectations were uh, on the agenda of COP26, uh, as well as uh, uh, many expectations are to today for COP27, which will happen in Egypt in one week from now. Uh, COP26 uh, was very important because we basically almost uh, finalized the, the rule book on the Paris Agreement implementation. So the decisions adopted by CMA3, uh, the conference of the parties uh, serving as the meeting of the parties to the Paris Agreement uh, included the three very important pieces, which are almost completely now the puzzle of the Paris Agreement rules. Those three uh, were the common timeframes. So we have a decision uh, indicating the common timeframes that should be applied by all parties when designing their NDCs. Uh, the rules for the implementation of Article 6, uh, that's a very important uh, item and topic that we're going to address also today, uh, the Article 6 uh, implementing rules have been adopted uh, in Glasgow with three key decisions, uh, uh, each on 6.2, 6.4 and 6.8. Um, still, a few elements are missing. Actually, I would say quite a few elements are missing and that will be the main task uh, of COP27. Uh, but in Glasgow, it was a very important step forward. Uh, it took us many years from Paris uh, to Glasgow to get these uh, uh, detailed rules and operational rules for the three mechanism uh, to be in place. Now we are still missing a few elements uh, for the Article 6 mechanism to be uh, ready for implementation. Uh, and many countries are already working on uh, and getting prepared for this very important moment. And the third piece uh, that came from Glasgow is, was the, is the missing elements that were there on the transparency framework. So we also have a very important decision uh, putting together all the missing elements for the transparency framework of the Paris Agreement, decision coming from, from Katowice. Uh, the decision from last year, Glasgow, is uh, providing the missing details, a lot of tables and reporting formats for uh, what countries have to fulfill in, uh, in, the, in the reporting requirements under the Paris Agreement. And a lot of our countries uh, know that this is going to be a lot of work uh, in doing that. Additional matters that were addressed by COP26 uh, uh, were mitigation and ambition, and we'll focus a little bit on mitigation and ambition in the next slide. But before getting to that, let me also mention adaptation and loss and damage, important piece that will be also taken up 
by COP27. In Glasgow, there was no agreement on the global goal on adaptation. What was agreed is just to launch a new process, a Glasgow Shamashake work program on the definition of the global goal on adaptation. That would be a key uh, task for uh, CMA4 and COP27 in Egypt. Uh, on loss and damage, there was no direct finance dedicated to loss and damage coming from Glasgow. And that's why uh, the COP27 agenda, the presidency is putting a lot of emphasis on loss and damage and the need for financing that uh, and support, uh, especially small island and LDCs. And then uh, the additional matter, which is uh, also important to mention, is climate finance. Uh, as we know, uh, we are uh, lacking the needed finance from the Copenhagen Accord and the Paris Agreement. And therefore, the agreement in Glasgow was to launch a new process for the new collective quantified goal on climate finance to be defined by 2025. So developed countries in particular are asked to increase the finance to developing countries. Uh, and uh, what, that is why we have now a new process under the Paris Agreement trying to get to a new collective goal on climate finance by 2025. So very briefly on mitigation and ambition, um, what is included uh, in, the, in the decision from Glasgow is a so-called Glasgow Climate Pact, which is the so-called overarching decision. A lot of expectations from Glasgow on ambition. We are uh, still uh, behind ambition. We are still behind, we need to do more. And the decision from Glasgow is mentioning that, is recognizing the science and urgency uh, coming from the IPCC science uh, and the fact that we are already at 1.1 uh, and keeping in mind that the goal of the Paris Agreement is 1.5. On mitigation, the overarching decision addressed a few items, in particular, the need to do more. Uh, there was also an indication of a number, 45% reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally needed by 2030. To relative to 2100, um, the setup of annual high level ministerial roundtables. Uh, there is a request to parties to revisit and strengthen their national uh, uh, objectives, the national NDCs, the NDCs uh, 2030 targets by the end of 2022, and not many parties are doing that. Um, and then there is a recognition of uh, the need to phase down the coal power and phase out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. That is the key of the overarching decisions coming from uh, Glasgow and the Climate Pact. Uh, Glasgow decision also uh, indicated uh, uh, the importance of uh, getting to 1.5 degree, the importance of uh, nature-based solutions and forest. And that is what we're gonna focus today's webinar. Uh, and in order to get to that, uh, it's important also to hear what the IPCC and the science is telling us in terms of the contribution of forest to the 1.5 goal, which is uh, essential. And on that, I'm giving the, back the floor to you, Michael, for, uh, for the next step. Thank you very much. Uh, and speaking of the science, before we get into the science from the IPCC, I noticed that Federica Vieta, our esteemed managing director of the coalition, has joined. Uh, Fede, would you like to maybe say a few words on the importance of these conferences and the role the coalition plays? You there? Michael, sorry. Yes, hi everyone. Um, I'm multitasking here and I was keeping this very soft. Um, I see that you called me. Now I just want to, um, to welcome everyone. I thank uh, uh, Leo for the great summary that provided um, and um, maybe add a little bit of color specific on the forest side. Um, you know, as Leo said, much was achieved. Unfortunately, forests were left uh, a little bit behind um, on the overall climate path. Uh, no uh, credit for early action were uh, secured uh, during uh, COP26. So, um, respiring countries are getting ready, um, you know, for COP27 and see if we can bring back some of the balance uh, um, that was there and continue continuing on the progress, uh, uh, you know, and some of the progresses that happened in, 20, in uh, COP26. So um, 
looking forward uh, um you know to to next uh, next week to be with everyone there and uh, thank you uh, michael leo and Thelma for providing this uh, great overview for all thank you fede we'll see you soon okay so moving on to Thelma krug who will now speak on behalf of the ipcc which on um, the scientific reporting provide uh, facilitates the policy discussions during COP. So Thelma, how likely is it to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius or lower? Well, quite a challenge question you are making. So before I respond to that, let me uh, welcome everyone. It is a pleasure to be here, obviously, and also uh, thank you, Leo, for this update on uh, what was achieved in COP26. Uh, and obviously, we will continue the discussion in part three, talking what we expected to have at COP27. So uh, it is nice to know that it's still the collective and global efforts to pursue limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees is alive uh, at the COP. And uh, we, we all know that the human activities have already caused an increase in the global temperature uh, uh, increase of 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And we also know that with every increment of warming, changes get larger in regional mean temperature, precipitation, soil moisture, and also in the frequency, intensity, and duration of extreme weather and climate events. So, uh, Michael, before I more directly respond to your question, I think that this gives me a little bit of the background I need. And uh, so I will start by saying that, you know, IPCC has uh, developed for this cycle, you know, five illustrative scenarios. So these scenarios, they, uh, they are emission scenarios that vary you know, depending on the socioeconomic mm -hmm. assumptions that are made, the levels of climate change mitigation and adaptation, population increase, technological developments. So there are several assumptions that are made and leading to these illustrative scenarios that go from top to bottom to, uh, to emission pathways uh, with uh, very high emissions. And then the one below in red, high emissions, an intermediate scenario in yellow, and then uh, you have uh, with the two blue curves, you know, scenarios with uh, low and very low emissions. Every one of these emission scenarios also have, um, uh, are linked also to how we expect the CO2 emissions to, to, to be. For instance, for the very high emission scenarios, we are expecting, for instance, where we project uh, that CO2 emissions would be doubled uh, by 2050 for the very high, for the very top, you know, scenario. And um, and for the very low emission scenarios, we're expecting obviously to, to come to net zero CO2 emissions by around 2050. And then, you know, after that, uh, go in, into negative emissions. If we want to have like a mapping into the implications of these different emission scenarios, uh, what you see on the right is, um, is, uh, is the best estimate. And these relate to the period 2081 to 2100. And for the very high uh, emission scenarios, which are the last, you know, diagrams you have, you see that the best estimate is 4.3 degrees Celsius. Be why do we have so many, so many of these, uh, you know, uh, 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 bars? Yeah, the first one is uh, is is showing the 4.3, where we are getting at the end of the century. The second bar relates to who is contributing most you know, to this uh, in terms of gas, and this is the CO2. Uh, the third bar is the greenhouse uh, non-CO2 gases. And finally, the last one would be the contribution of uh, aerosols that you see could have a negative effect in terms of, uh, of warming. So uh, if we go to the next one, and now I'm going to try to respond to your question more directly, Michael. So what this slide shows is that 
in the near term, sorry, we're not ta now talking in between 2021 to 2040. And if we look at the 1.5 degrees Celsius, which was your question, how likely it is to limit global warming to 1.5, well, we see that for the very high uh, emission scenario, uh, we have a very high probability. In the language of the IPCC, it is very likely that uh, 1.5 will be exceeded uh in this uh in you know in this uh near term for the high emission scenarios second one from top to down and uh, the probability is 66 to 100 percent to be exceeded and this also applies for the intermediate scenario and then if we come to the scenario with uh, low emissions uh, with the dark blue, uh, we have a more than 50% chance that it will be exceeded. And uh, finally, with the last one, it is also a chance of uh, more than 50% that uh, it is not going to be exceeded. It can be reached, but not exceeded. So this is, uh, gives you an idea of where we stand. So if we go to the very top, very high emissions, well, we're done. <laughs> so no way we are going to get to the 1.5. And then if we go to the very low emission scenarios, well, we have got a good chance, let's say, uh, to, to be uh, the 1.5 can be reached, but uh, is not expected to be or projected to be exceeded uh, in this near term. So I guess this means that we don't have much choice on the emission pathway to pursue the to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius or lower. We definitely do not have too much chance. And I think that Leo has already pointed out that in Glasgow, because we already had the report from the working group one uh, that indicated very clear that unless we have immediate, rapid and large scale reductions, uh, in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting global warming to 1.5, and I would say even to 2 degrees Celsius, uh, will be beyond reach. It's becoming very close to not, you know, being possible to get to those. Uh, so are there means to do this today? Yeah, uh, now we come to the, uh, you know, IPCC report in the next slide, uh, I guess, Michael, uh, it is as, um, yeah, if you can turn to the next slide. Yeah, the, the IPCC uh, uh, report on mitigation wasn't out at COP26. I think there was one before that. But anyway, yeah, so the IPCC mitigation report says very clear that we have uh, options available today in every sector to reduce at least uh, half uh, the emissions in 2030 compared to those uh, in 2019. Was there any slide before this one, Michael? No, so, was sorry there... about that. This here. Yeah, no, no problem, no problem. Yeah, it's, yes, that's good. Yeah, so that's the very clear message from the IPCC, and it's absolutely, you know, stunning because we have options now that could have you know, uh, by 2030 emissions compared to 2019. And in every sector, and also IPCC makes a, a, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, messages for demand and services as well, and the big contribution that, you know, uh, this uh, can also uh, provide. But because we are now uh, at the coalition, I will focus on the land use uh, sector, and uh, and so we will uh, be exploring some of the mitigation options since you know the messages there are options available now. So let's explore some of these mitigation options on land that can provide large scale emission reductions and also they can remove and store CO2 at scale. And uh, as IPCC says, most mitigation options are available and ready to deploy. So let's start then with the next slide. Yeah, there are some very important messages 
whoops. <laughs> yeah, there are several uh, important messages that IPCC provide for forests. And, and, and I really think, uh, Leo, that, you know, if uh, some of these messages can be captured at COP27, it would be uh, interesting, especially, you know, for uh, Article 6 and, and so on. So the land-based land mitigation measures, as IPCC says, represent some of the most important options currently available. And their rapid deployment is essential in all pathways that limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. So between 2020 and 2050, mitigation measures in forests and other natural ecosystems provide the largest share of the economic agriculture, forestry, and other, yeah, and other use uh, mitigation uh, potential. When I say economic potential, we are referring to options that cost less than $100 per ton of CO2 equivalent. So in the global sectoral studies that uh, IPCC has assessed, the protection, improved management, and restoration of forests peatlands, coastal wetlands, savannas, and grasslands have the potential to reduce emissions and all sequester uh, 3.3 uh, 7.3 billion tons of CO2 uh, equivalent per year. To give you an idea of what this means, uh, in 2019 alone, uh, the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions were 59 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. So this gives more or less you know, the contribution that we could have. And uh, so agriculture provides the second largest share of the mitigation potential. So if we go to the next one. So basically avoiding the conversion of uh, carbon rich primary peatlands, coastal wetlands and forests is particularly important as most carbon lost from those ecosystems are irrecoverable through restoration by the 2050 timeline of achieving net zero carbon emissions. What you see also in this slide is uh, uh, what are the technical and economic. So they are the first line on the technical mitigation potential and uh, the one below is the economic potential uh, for um, for uh, uh, for loop, uh, mitigation options. And you see that obviously these differ per region. Obviously, there are more opportunities in one region than another. Some of the regions, the same option might cost more than others, so it depends very much. So you see here some of the examples of uh, of the technical and economic mitigation potential for Latin America, Southeast Asia, and also Africa. So, so yeah, so the Thelma, just to start, just stop you there. Like, how how important is it to achieve the net so net zero carbon emissions? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mentioned it twice uh, during my presentation today, and, and 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 everybody has that big question mark because it means a lot. If you if you say you have to get net zero, that is balancing emissions and removals to zero, and this for the 1.5 represents being doing that in between 2050 and 2055. For the two degrees Celsius, would it be between 2070. 75, so it gives a little bit more time, but this half degree will have, uh, you know, an increase in the uh, risks of impacts in uh, the natural and human systems, right? So uh, regardless of the level one wants to limit the global warming, it requires that the CO2, the cumulative CO2 emissions are zeroed. So the point when you achieve that, that is directly related to where you can limit your temperature increase. So this is why we say we are expecting by 2050 the CO2 cumulative emissions to be uh, to be zeroed. Uh, if you want to go beyond, you know, is warming levels, 
obviously this is going to be giving time for more CO2 to be accumulated in the atmosphere, but we are going to have lots of impacts and lots of risks. OK, so if now moving to this slide, so the question is, OK, so we have several mitigation options that have large mitigation potentials, right? But is it feasible to implement them? So the IPCC identifies that the economical and political feasibility of implementing AFOLU mitigation measures is hampered by persistent barriers. So assisting countries to overcome these barriers will help to achieve significant short term mitigation. And obviously finance forms a critical barrier to achieving these gains as currently mitigation efforts rely principally on government sources and funding mechanisms which do not provide sufficient resources to enable the economic potential to be realized. So differences in cultural values, governance, accountability and institutional capacity are also important barriers. And climate change could also emerge as a barrier to AFOLU mitigation. So the continued loss of biodiversity makes ecosystems less resilient to climate change extremes, and this may further jeopardize the achievement of AFOLU mitigation. So to date, we had 0 0.7 billion per year US dollars. This is an estimate of what has been spent in AFOLU uh, mitigation per year. So this is well short of the more than 400 billion per year in terms of US dollars that is estimated to be necessary to deliver the up to 30% of global mitigation effort envisaged in deep mitigation scenarios. So this estimate of the global funding requirement is smaller than current subsidies provided to agriculture and forestry. So making this funding available would require a change in flows of money and determination of who pays. So effective, effective policy interventions in national investment plans as part of the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, specific to local circumstances and needs are urgently needed to accelerate the deployment of AFOLU mitigation options. These interventions are effective when, in, when they include funding schemes and long-term consistent support for implementation with governments taking the initiative together with the private funders and known state actors. So the next slide. Well, I must come to an end to more of the slides. This one is an interesting one because this um, obviously you cannot see much from the, the, the panel you have on the left, but I'm going to say what is there and then I, you know, give a highlight on the right, right hand side to what I really wanted to convey. So in this slide, we see the mitigation options costing uh, to costing up to $100 per tonne of CO2 equivalent, so up to, for the different sectors. And this include the energy, which is the, the first one, buildings, transport, industry. But also it provides these mitigation options for AFOLU, which I highlight with the blue arrow that you see, uh, that you see there and that I bring, you know, before that, Michael, please. Yeah, I'm still... Uh, on the one, sorry, yeah, yeah. Flipping so, on my slides. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So mm. you see uh, the three the three ones that I singularize. So that whole thing uh, refers to AFOLU. So there are agriculture mitigation options there, but I highlight with the three arrows uh, the ones that uh, relate uh, uh, to to follow. 
So uh, more specifically, we are talking here about uh, the reduced uh, conversion of forests to uh, to other uh, in other ecosystems, right? So we are talking here about deforestation. Basically, we are talking about also regeneration. We are talking about reforestation and afforestation, and also to improve sustainable uh, land uh, land ma management, sustainable forest man uh, management of forests, right? So. Uh, when we look at this, uh, you see these colors. These colors are related to how much uh, they would be costing. So, but what I want to call the attention in this slide is if you look on the left panel, you see that despite the fact that you have uh, energy also contributing a lot to the, to achieving, you know, a great mitigation uh, has a great mitigation potential. The second largest is really for the alpha loop. Despite the fact that we have on those gray bars, you have uh, some of the uncertainties also shown. So there are uncertainties on those. But if we look at the cost, we are talking here really about uh, reasonable costs for these uh, activities in a great uh, potential. So mitigation uh, options that cost less than $100. Uh, could uh, uh, reduce uh, the emissions. Uh, uh, or I, I mentioned that uh, also costing less than most of these options for a full cost less than 20 US dollars per ton of CO2. And um, so a lot comes from a reduced conversion of natural uh, ecosystems. The next one, which is my final one, uh, Michael. So this uh, is just uh, highlight some of the findings in the IPCC mitigation report. And basically what it says, I just picked up some of uh, the findings in the IPCC report that says that AFOLU um, has a, uh, would, could cover between 20 to 30% of the global mitigation needed for 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius towards 2050. And, um, and uh, the second one is that the deployment of flu mitigation measures remains slow, as we have already mentioned, and emission trends indicate unsatisfactory progress despite the beneficial contributions to global emission reductions from forest related options. And uh, the majority, more than 80% of emission reductions resulted from forestry measures. And where carefully and appropriately implemented, AFOLU mitigation measures are uniquely positioned to deliver substantial co-benefits and help address many of the wider challenges associated with land management. And finally, concerted, rapid and sustained effort by all stakeholders, from policymakers and investors to land, landowners and managers is a prerequisite to achieving high levels of mitigation in the AFOLU sector. And uh, Michael, to finalize, I just wanted to highlight and possibly giving this as a, as a bridge to, to Leo to continue. We see that those three errors that I indicated in my previous slide related to, uh, if we want to read on the red plus language, reduced emissions from deforestation, uh, enhancement of carbon stocks through afforestation, reforestation, rehabilitation of uh, degraded land, and also on the sustainable management of forests. So these are three hours are really, you know, mapped into the Red Plus activities. My final note is the finance. A finance is, uh, as I mentioned, is absolutely one of the, the barriers possibly one of the most important barriers for the implementation of these options. However, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, it's not, it, it, finance cannot just be for the implementation. We need money for the sustainable maintenance of these activities, in particular in developing countries, because you are really, you know, uh, uh, maintaining your forest up or reducing your emissions from deforestation that would give place to other activities like agriculture, pasture, or whatever. So how do you maintain those? So my final note is that finance 
for uh, for follow might be uh, might be uh, uh, something that has to be sustained through time. And I've, I I I will end here. And uh, thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you, Thelma. Uh, for putting so much data into a short amount of time. So I appreciate that. And please, again, if anyone has questions, uh, feel free to put those in the chat when you want. So moving on now to uh, COP27, um, back to you, Leo. Yes, thank you, Michael. And thank you, Thelma, for the excellent uh, uh, presentation of these important numbers and data. Um, so we're going to address now the last chunk of our uh, talk today, uh, COP27, before we just open for questions um, that can also be indicated through the chat. And I think the messages sent by Telma through the IPCC are very important, uh, uh, very important numbers. And many of these information, uh, I think, should be really be uh, at the beginning of every of uh, every intervention that we're going to make uh, as Rainforest Nations uh, at the COP, uh, I recognize very importantly the fact that the IPCC is recognizing as economic value of a uh, ton of CO2 reductions from, um, from land use, this $100, which is really, I think, the goal that we are all aiming uh, to get the finance that is needed. Also, the fact that uh, the IPCC is referring to the lack of finance uh, and lack of ambition in finance. So we uh, talk always about ambition in mitigation, but ambition on finance is really an important uh, part of the of the discussion, at least for 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 reinforced nation for ourselves. So COP27 um, will happen uh, uh, as soon as uh, in seven days, more or less. So we'll start on the 6th of November, and it's going to be two weeks in Egypt. Uh, and again, as usual, uh, we're going to have a lot of uh, different bodies meeting at the same time. You have here just the list for your convenience. COP27, the CMP, the Kyoto Protocol is still there, CMA4, which is going to address Article 6, as mentioned before, and then, of course, the two subsidiary bodies, the two permanent subsidiary bodies under the Convention and the Paris Agreement, the SABSTA and the SBI, uh, for the 57th session. In addition to these uh, um, formal events, there are going to be a lot of other events, side events, the coalition is going to have a very big pavilion, and uh, I'm sure Michael uh, knows that very well. So we're going to have also a lot of events from our countries in our pavilion. So it's going to be, uh, as usual, uh, a lot of events, a lot of work for all of us. So let's get to the menu of COP27. And I uh, just uh, decided to focus on three main uh, 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 chapters. Um, so the next slide, uh, the one on uh, mitigation, Finance and Article 6, where Red Plus in particular is uh, is fitting. So mitigation, uh, um, the program of COP27 will be to look at the, the work program on mitigation ambition and implementation that was launched last year in Glasgow. The goal is to get to a decision by CMA4 on the uh, on this work program, basically to launch a new process which should help the global stock take. And, uh, and the Paris Agreement uh, to get on track on the 1.5 goal. So under this work program, there will be uh, some sessions and some uh, work, homework for the countries, for the parties, to increase ambition and implementation. And uh, in Bonn, in June, there was uh, a proposal by many parties that uh, this work program should also focus on sectors. So I guess forest uh, will have to be a key sector under this work program, which will be the subject of uh, a CMA decision in uh, in COP27, uh, trying to uh, make sure that uh, developed countries and big developing countries get their share of uh, responsibility in terms of action, but also in terms of uh, support and finance. The second point of mitigation is going to be the inputs that will be given uh, uh, by the COP to the first global stock take, which will finish uh, in uh, COP28 next year in 2023. And just for your information, Red Plus is going to be one of the topics that will be discussed in the technical dialogues under the first global stock take. We were just uh, acknowledged a couple of days ago from the Secretariat that the Red Plus is going to be accepted as one of the topics. So that is also to be put on our agenda to follow and contribute to this the technical discussion to make sure that we highlight uh, as much as we can the importance of uh, Red Plus in the fight and in the run uh, uh, up to the 1.5 goal uh, objective. 
And the third element is going to be the, another part of mitigation to be addressed by COP27, which will be the second periodic review of the global objective uh, of the convention. So the next topic is going to be finance. Finance, as we have just heard also from the IPCC, is key. And we need the more finance. We need more public finance and more private finance. In terms of finance, COP27 uh, will try to make up what wasn't agreed uh, in Glasgow. And uh, the Egyptian um, presidency is working very hard on that. We have also had, uh, had just uh, the pre-COP session in Kinshasa by DRC. So uh, COP27 being an African COP uh, is going to most likely uh, and hopefully produce a better result in terms of finance and commitment from developed countries uh, on finance for the next uh, few years. These are on the screen just a few elements that will be addressed by the COP and the CMA. I think it's important to remind the um, uh, one of the topics here, especially new collective quantified goal. So this process for establishing a new establishing a new quantified goal uh, by 2025, which is going to be it's going to give some stability on the finance released on the finance that is expected by developing countries. And as I mentioned at the beginning, also loss and damage finance will be addressed by COP27. Uh, including also a guidance to the GCF, the Green Climate Fund, where we hope that a new window for Red Plus uh, support will be issued soon, since the, the first uh, wave is almost uh, um, uh, finalized. So we are also hoping that some finance will come from there. And then the final and most important topic for, uh, for our countries will be Article 6. Uh, in uh, in uh, Shame Sheikh, Article 6 uh, 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 guidance will have to be finalized. In particular, uh, we can move to the next slide. Uh, thanks, Michael. In particular, we will have uh, to look and finalize the guidance on 6.2 and the cooperative approaches, finalize the guidance on 6.4, in particular, the rules, modalities, and procedure for the mechanism. Also, 6.8 will have uh, a place uh, and it's something to, to play in, uh, in Egypt. In terms of uh, Article 6.2 and 6.4, we will be starting from the negotiating text uh, that were left from June, but just a couple of days ago, actually Monday and Tuesday this week, the Substa chair has just released the new, uh, very new and very fresh negotiating text on 6.2 and 6.4, which is capturing all the views that were expressed uh, in June with a few changes. And so we, this will be our starting point and we need, really need to focus on those two documents to make sure that uh, um, our, our priorities are included, uh, in particular in relation, of course, uh, to Red Plus and indeed to finance Red Plus through the participation in the Article 6.2 mechanism. So in the next slide, uh, there is a, just an indication of what decisions are expected from CMA4 on Article 6 in particular, the finalization of the rules and procedure on 6.4, uh, the rules on the reporting infrastructure, which is needed for 6.4 and 6.2, in particular, the setting up of registries, uh, the implementation of the share of proceeds, uh, also guidelines on the methodologies principles that will have to be established for 6.4, the issue of emissions avoidance and conservation enhancement will also be tackled here, uh, and also, as indicated, some uh, additional uh, matters on 6.8. Um, if we can move to the next, uh, Michael, here we just have a recap on the role of Article 6, uh, sorry, Red Plus into Article 6 uh, that is being mentioned uh, by our countries very often in the negotiations. So we uh, have uh, a Red Plus mechanism which is, uh, which is done, which is set. Uh, captured in Article 5, where all the Red Plus decisions are covered. Um, Re Article 5 is looking at the reduction and removals uh, as created mechanism agreed under the Paris Agreement. Uh, the Red Plus results uh, can be considered ITMOS post 2021, following the decision adopted in Glasgow. Uh, of course, we also need uh, a space for financing all the Red Plus efforts uh, before 2021, and the coalition is are working hardly on that as well. Red Plus countries, just to remind uh, uh, all of us, uh, must have in place strategies, national strategies, the forest reference level, 
in the national force monitoring systems, safeguard information system, uh, reference levels verified, uh, and then the technical uh, result, the results on the class to be put in the technical annexes. And as many countries that are present today know, the coalition is working hard on making sure that all these requirements are fulfilled in a proper manner and that consistency between all these uh, documentation and NDCs and greenhouse gas inventories uh, is ensured. Uh, Article 6.2 will go undergo a technical expert review uh, that has some boundaries which are already given by the decision, decision from Glasgow. The technical review on 6.2 is going to be complementary to the review under uh, of Red Plus. So our review that we uh, will undergo under Red Plus uh, is going to be served uh, very useful under the Article 6 review. The Article 6 review will just look at the consistency of the information provided, but not do another review of uh, our results. Uh, and uh, as coalition, we have been advocating a lot that uh, also the other sectors should undergo the same uh, process as we all follow for Red Plus in order to be able to produce uh, uh, results which can be traded as, as ITMOS. Um, the UNFCC principle that data cannot be revised, uh, uh, reviewed twice is uh, behind uh, this uh, reasoning. Uh, and then uh, uh, my Article 6.2 must recognize Article 5 reviews uh, with a view to avoid any redundancy. So we'll uh, for sure uh, make sure we will push uh, hard on that and make sure that uh, our efforts and our very thorough review process uh, is going to be uh, uh, covered by the Article 6 uh, uh, final decision. And then, Michael, the last slide from my side here is just to recap what's, which are going to be our priorities in terms of Red Plus and Article 6 for um, COP27. We have to make sure that uh, uh, the achievement and the progress made in COP26 uh, are improved. Uh, and, uh, and the fact that our instances uh, have to be fully on board in the COP27 decision, including uh, the pre-2020 uh, issue of uh, efforts uh, and all the other related uh, information. Uh, we also have to, to push strongly on the fact that we need to restore equity, justice and balance related to the pre-2020 crediting, in particular, given the fact that the CDM credits have been given the chance to be carried over to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and uh, while for ITMOS, we are only talking about post-2021 credits, so we need to recognize the important efforts made by rainforest nations pre-2020, which are, of course, key if we want to uh, achieve the 1.5 goal as indicated by the IPCC, and we just heard that. Um, and also the importance, of course, removals the question of uh, additionality, which is going to be addressed in the many discussion under Article 6, uh, is, uh, is uh, different for Red Plus, where we have a national program, is different from uh, project-based mechanism, and uh, the issue of removals is key uh, to be included in the concept of additionality under Article 5 and Red Plus. Um, the Article 6.2 review, we just mentioned that, the technical review process that will happen under 6.2 is going to respect the review that uh, Red Plus countries are undergoing uh, through the Red Plus decisions. Um, and finally, on 6.4, uh, many tensions uh, to watch to ensure that the Red Plus mechanism is not to be compromised by uh, the possibility that voluntary carbon standards have to enter the, six, uh, the Article 6 mechanism and make sure that the good practice, which is provided by Red Plus implementation in all reinforced nations, is used as an example and as a model in particular in reference to the national um, context, the nationally determined reference levels and the national greenhouse gas inventories. So this is really important to make sure that uh, the efforts that will be financed through Article 6 are on the same footage and that uh, environmental integrity is preserved. With that, Michael, I'm gonna stop here and give the floor back to you and to all the colleagues for any question or comment. Yes, thank you, Leo. Let me pull this down. Um, and also, as Leo mentioned, we do have a really fantastic pavilion set up. I'm going to put our YouTube channel uh, link in here. Uh, we have some fantastic uh, live events that we'll be broadcasting on this. So if you don't already follow our channel, be sure to do that. Um, 
just to keep up with some of the presentations we'll be doing. I uh, do believe I saw a few questions come in uh, that we can address. Uh, one from Eduardo Reyes. Uh, so Thelma presents some interesting numbers. It seems that the Opelu needs uh, 400 billion US dollars a year to reduce emissions and keep us on the right track for the 1.5 degrees Celsius. However, the GCF only has a bit more than 11 billion US dollars. Uh, said we also need that under the carbon markets, 100 US dollars of carbon to be paid to this sector under Red Plus. None of these options are happening. Does this mean that we are in the very high scenario that you presented, Thelma? Any advice from both of you? Okay, I'm gonna be very, thank you, Eduardo. Nice to see you here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, first to respond from, you know, from your last part. No, we, we are not in the in the very high uh, emission pathway, uh, I would say. If we put together all the indices, you know, uh, considering that the policies by 2020 that have been implemented, then, uh, and, and continued if they don't change, uh, then we would be having a, uh, we are leading to a 3.2, let's say. There is a range, but anyway, a 3.2 degrees Celsius above pre industrial level. So it's quite bad. <laughs> it's quite bad. We need much more. Now, the issue on the money, you know, those have been estimated using uh, using some, uh, some uh, models, right? So some sectoral models that say that the net costs of delivering between five to six billions of CO2 per year of forest related carbon sequestration and emission reduction. So we are talking about both, you know, removals and uh, reducing emissions uh, are estimated to reach approximately those $400 billion but per, per year by 2050 that I mentioned. If you want to know a little bit more about these figures, uh, please refer to the summer for policy makers on mitigation uh, report of the IPCC. That is bullet point C.9.4. And then it relates also to the sections where this is a little bit more elaborated. So this cost is to, to basically cover for the direct effects of any changes in the activities, as I have mentioned when I was ending my presentation, as well to cover for the opportunity costs associated with uh, land use change. So you have to cover that because if you have, you know, better opportunity than, you know, <laughs> reducing the emissions from deforestation or not converting it for other means, uh, I mean, that's uh, not really doable. So uh, we are quite behind the needed financial flows. The IPCC recognizes that progress in aligning the financial flows towards the goal of the Paris Agreement. distributed across regions and sectors. So this is very comprehensive response to your question. I hope it helps, Eduardo. Uh, and then five minutes left, so we have another question here uh, from Hilary Dassey about uh, the need to know, how does the OMGE work? Yeah, okay. yeah Michael, thank you. Thank you, Hilary. Yeah, so OMGE is the overall mitigation in global, in global emission and that's a concept that have been introduced uh, by, uh, in particular, by uh, SEEDS, by the OASIS, a concept which is applying to 6.2, but in particular to 6.4. And that is a concept that has been introduced just to make sure that uh, the uh, Article 6 mechanism are going to uh, ensure environmental integrity is preserved. Uh, so there will be a section a part of uh, the uh, reduction that will be exchanged through 6.2 or 6.4 that will have to uh, be uh, set aside in order to cover and to make sure that uh, the this mechanism I'm gonna, are going to overall contribute to the 1.5 goal and are going to contribute uh, to this uh, uh, ambition. Uh, and there's also going to be uh, some uh, financial uh, that will go um, to 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 contribute to that, especially from six four, if I'm not um, mistaken. So this is about the ambition in uh, in the mitigation of this mechanism. Uh, anyway, the OMG details will also be part of the decision that will have to be 
provided and produced by COP27 in order to have final rules on that. Um, and just Michael, sorry, I see also Eduardo mentioned a couple of questions. Yes, uh, uh, on the work program and the mitigation, uh, so far we haven't really discussed the sectors, but uh, forests will have to be included there and will be included there. And this work program will be launched, hopefully by Shama Sheikh, and uh, uh, sectors, including forests, will be one key part of that. And another question, which is uh, about the transparency and the reporting requirements, uh, which is uh, coming uh, very often uh, to us, is the, when this article, article 6.2 review will happen. In my interpretation of the rules, this will happen during the BTR review. So we have uh, now a BUR that will, come a B, it will become a BTR review that will uh, also involve the review of Red Plus technical annexes. And how the rules have been established is that uh, this uh, uh, review will also consider the contribution and the information coming from Article 6, just to make sure that we don't lose any time. So uh, Red Plus countries have to be uh, get ready to produce also the required information for Article 6 to make sure that everything is in place and the Red Plus results are finally put on the website uh, and on the Info Hub. All right. Thank you, Leo. I think that is the end of the questions there. Um, thanks again for everyone joining. Uh, we really appreciate it. We hope this helped uh, bring an understanding of what we're expecting to accomplish uh, coming up into COP27 uh, to uh, all my friends and colleagues here that will be in Egypt. Uh, I look forward to seeing you there. For those that are joining us that will not be, please follow us on our social media networks, our YouTube channel there to keep up with um, live updates from what's coming from the conference. Uh, thank you both to our speakers, Thelma and Leo, and everyone have a good day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.